completes that great cavalcade of the year's outstanding events in the sporting calendar. Sports Review of 1987. Basically, I lost a tennis match, you know. I didn't lose a war, uh, nobody died, I lost a tennis match. I know how bad it feels to lose, and it'll never happen again. And I hope they will watch it, because it never will. Judges and the referee say he won the fight, so he won the fight, and now I'm ex-champion, and good luck to him, you know. The crowd all around the circuit was willing me on. I've got to thank them for the win. Didn't watch. I went and sat in some of the offices, and I sat in between the two TVs, so I couldn't see anything. This is the greatest week of my life. That's all I can say. Welcome to the 34th Sports Review of the Year, and with us to celebrate it, so many of the names who've made the sporting headlines in 1987. And as usual, a special welcome to Sports Review's Old Boy Network, and girls too, of course, who you've selected as the BBC Sports personality down the years. Good evening. Delighted you're with us because, in a sense, this is the programme that you produce. As ever, it's your votes that will select this year's sports personality. And to present the award in around an hour and a half from now, a man who represented his country on over a hundred occasions, the former Kent and England cricket captain, Colin Cowdery. Now, the award, that coveted trophy that we always have on display, you know, the replica of an early BBC camera. Well, this is a live programme, and, uh, but it is the responsibility of last year's winner to get it back on time, on time for this year's show. Now, you would think of all people that last year's winner would be able to do that on time. Yes, sir, can I help you? Hi, Nigel Mansell, Sports Review of the Year. Oh, yeah. you're the fifth one we had today, sir. Have you got any ID? I'll bet you I'm the only one with this. Oh, I'd better bring it back. <laughs> yeah, that'd do nicely, sir. Thank you very much. <laughs> Not here, mate. Round the back. <laughs> Not here, mate. <laughs> That's good, that. I wanted to keep the trophy anyway, didn't we? <laughs> Come on, we'll go home now. Where is he? I don't know. With a bit of luck. Thank you, Nigel. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much indeed. What, uh, what sort of time do you call this, then? Split second timing. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely perfect. The special constable thing is absolutely for real, isn't it, on the Isle of Man? Um, 
you spend oh, what? He wants me to say something now. Well, I, 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 keep, I keep forgetting that this is lying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, go well, on. As you know, you wanted me to be in my uniform tonight, and uh, I decided against that because it is very, very serious and not to be taken lightly. Oh, really? And not only that, I'll arrest you now and take that trophy back. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't nicked anyone for speeding yet, then, have you? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, and what about the old injuries? You're back to full fitness for next year and all the rest uh, of it? Unfortunately, at the moment, no. Um, I'm not going to be able to drive the car probably until the end of January, perhaps the beginning of February, but uh, right. certainly be stronger and better then. OK, thanks very much. We'll talk to you again later Thank on. You. It's getting a bit heavy, this. Well. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yes, goodbye to that for you for the moment. Right. I hope I've got it around the right way and everything. Lots of famous names around there. Well, now that the trophy is safely here, we can get on. We've got some wonderful reminders of the sporting year and a lot of people to meet again. Well, the two further awards to be presented tonight honour the top overseas personality and also the team of the year. But in 1987, the focus of attention for Britain's top athletes was Rome and the Second World Championships. And there were some notable performances en route. Todd Bennett and Yvonne Murray won gold at the European Indoor Championships. At the European Cup in Prague, gold for Kirsty Wade and Tom McKean, and a sprint double for Linford Christie. All of which put Britain in tremendous heart for the major event in August. The ancient city of Rome. The historic venue for one of the newest and biggest events in sport, the World Athletics Championships. The Olympic Arena, a superb setting for the race between two of the world's fastest humans, Carl Lewis, world and Olympic champion, Ben Johnson, the current world number one. Away they go, Johnson got a beauty, and Linford Christie went well, but Craig went well, but Johnson's away and clear. It's Johnson, Lewis and Christie, and Johnson storms out to win. In second place was Lewis, and the world record smashed out of sight. Absolutely gone. The time, 9.83, a full metre faster than anyone ever before. Made possible by a staggering reaction time off the blocks of 0.129 and he's well clear in the first few strides. Johnson, world champion, the quickest sprinter in history, a record he took from Calvin Smith, who defended his world title in the 200 metres, with Britain's John Regis drawn on the inside. It produced a race only the photo finish camera could decide. Canada of France is going well, Calvin Smith come off the bend well, but look at John Regis. John Regis is going for gold, the silver is up there with him. Kenneth Bay making the last bid to get past Peel off, and suddenly Calvin Smith comes in the picture and he's going to take a photograph to separate them. A fiftieth of a second split the first three. The bronze for Regis, a British record, gold again for Smith, and silver for Kenneth Hervey. At first, I thought I'd won it, but on the replay it showed that um, Calvin and the French guy Kenneth Hervey just beat me to the line. Um, my coach is going to be a bit angry because I dipped again too early, but hopefully for next year I'll be able to rectify that. At 800 metres, Tom McKean, who's won two European Cup finals, looked tense for the final and it showed in the race. He was always in trouble. But Peter Elliott was always where he likes to be, battling with the front runners. Quinchella and Barbosa with Peter Elliott in third place. What a brave run, he's going to get a medal. And Quinchella strikes for home. Elliott coming on the inside. And Quinchella will take the goal for Kenya. Elliott takes the unexpected silver for Britain. And Chile, yet another fine African winner. Elliot, who thrives on hard racing, well pleased. McKean left to reflect on what turned out to be his only bad race of the season. John Ridgeon's recent UK record in the high hurdles emphasised his chance of a medal, and Colin Jackson, world junior champion, also had hopes. But Greg Foster, the defending champion, was clear favourite. And here comes Ridgeon, but Foster, Foster going through. Foster, Ridgeon and Jackson, we've got the silver and the bronze. Ridgeon came through, so did Jackson, and we've got silver and bronze, and look at that. The form book was right, and for Chris Akabusi, there was a first season place in the 400 hurdles final. The event Ed Moses dominated until losing after 122 straight wins. Harold Smith, the European champion, was a real threat, and the race was all it promised. Ed Moses has taken control yet again. Chris Akabusi running the race of his life. Ed Moses off the pen, and Harold Smith gets past Danny Harris. Ed Moses is flying again. And he's still in command. And Danny Harris is getting after him. And Ed Moses is wiltering. Ed Moses going for the line. And, and Harold Smith. And together, oh, Moses retains his crown. Harold Smith.
Pivot and Danny Harris clean themselves at the line. Moses won with Harrison Smith second and third in the same time. There was no decathlon victory music for Daley Thompson this time. Unbeaten since 1978, his preparation was affected by injury. And it was clear in the first event, the sprint which he won, he wasn't very happy. As the storm broke at the end of the first day, his soaking fans were still there. But it was obvious to everyone there would be a new world champion. With Voss of East Germany, the leader, and Vence of West Germany in close contention. Daly, though struggling, lost his title with dignity and battled on throughout the second day, knowing he'd no chance. And eventually, it was Voss who made sure of the championship. And Torsten Voss will go in the history books as the new world champion, taking the title from Daly Thompson, and he finishes third here. Which was good enough. And the champion they all admire won new friends in defeat with a generous tribute, but with no doubts about the future. I'm not afraid to lose. I mean, I tell you, after sitting, sitting in the tunnel for a couple of hours by myself, I, I know how bad it feels to lose, and it'll never happen again. And I hope they will watch it, because it never will. Steve Cram was another Briton expected to take a second world championship. In the build-up to Rome, Cram was looking better and better after early season problems. But the 1500 meters final was one race too many after two qualifying rounds. Feely looking very, very dangerous. Gonzalez in third place, and Cram looks tired. And we could have a new world champion. Cram is beaten now, and Billy of Somalia comes away with Gonzalez in second place and a very, very tired looking Steve Cram fading badly down the straight. A magnificent win from the man from Somalia. Billy, the man that Cram feared, wins it. Gonzalez second. Spivey third, and Cram back in eighth place, finished weary, disillusioned, and disappointed. While Cram couldn't get it right, Awita, his great rival, couldn't go wrong. And a month before the World Championships, he showed his record-breaking form in the same stadium in Rome. Awita once more against the clock. His world record, 13 minutes, 0, 0. 0.4 seconds. That's what he's got to beat. Has he done it? Yes, he has! He's broken the world record! Well, that frightened the opposition so much, the world final became a slow tactical race. But Awita still won easily, with Britain's fast-finishing Jack Buckner third. Awita, Olympic champion, world record holder, now world champion. What next? Derek Redmond in the 400 metres broke the UK record to reach the final and gave Britain a fine start in the relay. It was Akabusi then to Roger Black, the European champion, who'd been rested for the final after injury. And Phil Brown back on the anchor leg, which transforms him, chasing America, and hunted by Hernandez of Cuba and Smith of West Germany. So it looks like gold for America, but what can Brown do? He's famous for these last legs of the relay, and he's going away. And Brown has run a remarkable last leg. It's gold and the world championship for America, and Britain get a superb silver. Brown says a is sorry. Though his teammates know, it was a brilliant last leg, a new British, Commonwealth and European record. Fatima Whitbread was the sole Briton to win a world title. But the European champion wasn't to know that, as she launched the javelin in the fifth round. And that's a very big throw, it's about 76 and a half metres. Well, could that be the gold medal throw? Petra Felker, the world record holder, one throw left. Fatima, beaten with the very last throw four years ago, could again only wait and hope. It's tailed down, and Fatima Whitbread is the world champion. The world record holder is beaten. Well, great year, Fatima. Many congratulations. 87, in a sense, was the year of the wiggle for you. What are we looking forward to in 88? <laughs> Well, I've been practising a few new steps with uh, Eddie Large, so we might see the tango in the new year. <laughs> Who do you expect to be your major rival for the Olympic title? Felker again? Yes, I think it's fair to say that Petra Felker from the DDR will be my main uh, rival. Mm -hmm. But I, I think Tester Sanderson also, and uh, Beata Piet from West Germany. Right. Everybody thinks that you just go out and throw the javelin, I suspect, but it takes an awful lot of hard work behind the scenes. Uh, how do you spend the winter? I mean, training all the way through? 
Well, like you said, a lot of people think we go back into closets and come out in the summertime tightly sprung, ready to compete. In actual fact, the training is here in the winter months for seven months a year. Uh, seven days a week, four times a day, so it's an awful lot of hard work. And you have to be an all-round athlete too. I know you run the mile pretty quickly. Tell uh -huh. us what sort of time you do a mile in. Well, I have uh, recorded a mile in four minutes 35, so that's not bad. It certainly isn't bad. Steve Crammel there alongside you. Steve, it was all going terribly well until Rome, wasn't it? Well, the way I finished that race in Rome, I think I'm going to have to watch out for Fatima if she's running that for us. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it went wrong in Rome. I th I don't, obviously, the, the whole season was very disappointing. I don't think it was, you know, it wasn't just what happened in Rome. I think uh, 87 was a bad year, you know. Sunderland got relegated and uh, <laughs> I didn't run well. I'll just forget about it. I'm looking forward to New Year's Eve and I'm going to say bye-bye 1987 and look yeah. forward to 88. People were talking about the fact that you might have been ill uh, in Rome. But there wasn't anything in that, was there? I don't think there was. I mean, I, I didn't feel as I was particularly ill in Rome. I mean, the, you know, I didn't feel any different. I had done all season. I'd had uh, slight problems with uh, the kidney stones early on in the year, but that, that's not a problem which affects me long term. Mm. Um, and just on the point of illness, can I say, if Jimmy's watching, <coughs> Jimmy Headley had Your a heart coach, attack. Yeah, he had a heart attack yesterday, and hopefully he's, he's well in hospital. Yeah, we all wish and, him well uh, from here. Yeah. Right. So, so I'm not ill. I'm fine. So honestly. soul is the goal. Yeah, football pun again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I think, uh, you know, I'm not sort of sitting every day during the winter months worrying about next September. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just training hard at the moment and uh, with this vague idea of the Olympics in eight months' time, you know, I'm not going to worry about it and hopefully things will go better than they did last year and uh, I'll be in there giving it, hopefully, the, you know, the real Steve Cram will be back this year. We hope so. We wish you the best. Steve Cram and Fatima Whitbread, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Well, boxing was big business in 1987. In Las Vegas in April, Marvin Hagler and Sugar Ray Leonard were guaranteed a record $23 million for their world middleweight title challenge. Leonard, on his comeback, scored a famous victory. Domestic box office records were broken by Frank Bruno and Joe Bugner at White Hart Lane, even though it wasn't a title fight. But when there was a title at stake, well, one man definitely looked the part. Lloyd Hunnigan had taken to being world champion, like a duck to water. Modesty, force or otherwise, was playing no part in this champion's profile. His first defence of the title he'd won from the great Don Curry came in February. The challenger, Johnny Bumfus, had just about weathered Hunnigan's pre-fight stairs and the first round when this happened. Hunnigan had far more problems in his next defence in April against another American, Morris Blocker, but once again proved triumphant, this time on points. Then in midsummer, with the rain in Spain falling mainly in the bull ring, it was the bull who was wearing the cape. Gene Hatcher, the challenger, first round. And if Hatcher survives this, it's a miracle. He's gone. It's all over in about half a minute. 40 seconds to be exact, the fastest world title defence on record. Challenge number four came in October from a tough Mexican, Jorge Vaca. A now unhappy Hunnigan, both in and out of the ring, was already having his work cut out when an accidental head clash ended the fight in the eighth round. The Mexican, a judge to be leading on points, had taken Hunnigan's title. I don't make no excuse. The, re the judges and the referees say he won the fight, so he won the fight, and now I'm ex-champion, and good luck to him, you know. Dennis Andres also lost a world championship in 87, the WBC light heavyweight title to Thomas Hearns. Meanwhile, in between shifts at Tilbury Fire Station, Terry Marsh had become IBF light welterweight champion, beating Joe Manley of the USA. But after one defence, Marsh was KO'd by the doctors. Epilepsy had ended his career. A lot of people are treating it as a tragedy for me, but uh, I feel there's a lot of people a lot, lot worse off than myself. I feel I was fortunate in de developing it uh, at the stage I have as opposed to 20 years ago. So I've been able to achieve everything I wanted to achieve, and anything I do in life now, I'll consider a bonus anyway. Harold Graham was one fight away from a world middleweight title challenge, but Sambu Kalambe made it a costly one. Oh, he's got Graham with a right! The right that always threatened has found him at the finish. 
Last week, however, Graham returned to the ring, reverted to his old style, and showed against Ricky Stackhouse that he's still to be reckoned with. Yes, the world heavyweight champion himself came to town this year to take a look at prospective challenger Frank Bruno. Phyllis, Phyllis is now from nose bleeding badly and he's hurt in the fifth and he might be going. He doesn't want to fight on and the referee stopped it anyway. James Tillis had gone the distance with Mike Tyson. It was an impressive win. Then that old immovable object returned to take on the irresistible force. As far as I'm concerned, I have the strength, the size, and also the ability to beat him. But it was goodbye Joe all right. Frank stopped him in eight rounds. Hello, Frank. Where's Hello. Terry? Hello. Where's Harry? Uh, uh, <laughs> <where's Harry? laughs> well, we got that out of the way right, now yeah. at, at, at last. Was that really a needle match between you and Bugner? About five years needle, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it was all cricket. Was it? Cricket. <laughs> yeah. You think that's <laughs> What did he have to say to you after the fight, Much? Um, we made a lot of money together and he wished me a happy Christmas and a good day <laughs> so. Now, inevitably, Mike Tyson, he fights yeah. Holmes, doesn't he? Holmes, Holmes is making yeah. a comeback. What do you right. think about that one? Um, it's a very strange comeback, but good luck to him. Hope he does well in that fight. Do you think Tyson's going to win it there? I think so. I'm not too sure. You can never put your money... If it was sure, I would put all my money on it and win some more money. Yeah. <laughs> but then it'll be you, will it, Frank? I yeah, mean, you're in the next. summer, that's what I'm hoping for, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, hopefully the World Fingers Heavyweight crossed, Championship yeah. will long last. Right. You've been waiting a long while for I'll it. I'll be trying this, that's all I can say. We're, sure, trying. we're sure of that, Frank. Thank now, you. Lloyd Hannigan alongside you there, who sadly lost his, uh, his title. And what was the problem, Lloyd? Because you were unhappy going into the ring uh, that yes. night, weren't you? Yes, well, um talk about it so much now people must get fed up of it i wish you could talk about something else um it was just my hand i was a bit cricket. problem <laughs> <laughs> hand problems really yes, hand problem really. yeah but you were going to quit after that fight i mean that was yes yeah, so, well i had you know i didn't want to make no rational decision because we're training bobby so i must think about it mm. so i took my time and, um just i want to come back and i'm ready rearing to go to be the old lad hanging in the ring Certainly. So you're going to fight again. And when, when might we see you in action? Well, um, I'm hoping for April. And God help the guy that I get in there. <laughs> well, we wish you the very best of luck. <laughs> Lloyd Hannigan and Frank Bruno. Nineteen eighty seven was always going to be an historic year for rugby union, not so much for the French victory in the Five Nations Championship, although that was impressive enough. But because in June the rugby world was due to come together for the first World Cup, and in New Zealand and Australia, all doubts about the organization, the potential, and the spirit of the competition were dispelled in glorious fashion. And making history they were. Not just Canada or alongside the elite nations, but Tonga, Italy, Zimbabwe. All had their moments of glory, like the USA against Australia. England emerged from a home season of more depths than heights to see hopes of victory against Australia slip from their grasp after a dubious Campisi try. But despite that, England qualified from their pool before their world turned upside down. It was Wales in the quarter-final who had the commitment, and Robert Jones, to snuff out any lingering English hopes. Collins down, a chance on here, turns to make it available as Robert Jones kicks on. The shoots come hard in combat, Robert Jones is there! Ireland got into an awful tangle in their quarter-final with the Wallabies, and they only came to life when it was all long gone. And here's Irish resilience and spirit personified. A chance with Kiernan. Kiernan beats one man, beats two. Tremendous score. Scotland set out in superb style and gave rich promise of things to come. 
in a 20-all thriller. Their opening game against France. Now it's Ledo once more. And Duncan's in. The try is given. But injury deprives Scotland of John Rutherford, as well as Geoffrey and Scott Hastings, for the quarter-final clash with the all-black machine. No one in the World Cup was to match New Zealand forward power and discipline, and Scotland the Brave was sent reeling like everyone else. Curtin's spirit bumps all the way along the line to Stanley. This is the full-back Gallagher. That's the try that seals the match for New Zealand. After Scotland, it was Wales put on the rack by New Zealand. Grand Slam France alone kept the Five Nations flag flying, and their semi-final with Australia was a classic. To many, the greatest international ever. Nicely out, Stella has a great chance. Stella's peeking through. What a brilliant try! Far Jones. Liner. Liner steps inside his man. Magnificent break by Liner. Trying to feed outside there to Greg. It's going to be a try for Campese. Rich in skills, agonizing in its excitement. With seconds only to go, it was 24 all. Interception almost by Van Outram. A great try, Rodriguez standing on and Blanco has scored. That's the try, surely, that takes the Frenchman into the final. Australia never really recovered, and it was a proud third place in the end for Wales, thanks to Paul Thorburn's final conversion. A superbly kicked. He has done it. He'll never kick finer than that. So to Auckland for the ideal final, the Northern versus the Southern Hemisphere. But Grant Fox, completing a tournament total of 126 points in six games, ferocious power and superb skills all round, plus insuperable talents of such as John Kerwin and Michael Jones. These combined to provide a force to subdue the French. New Zealand captain David Kirk set the standard in every respect. And at the end of a marvellous tournament, as he lifted the Webb Ellis Cup, the rest of the world knew the task confronting them in 1991. In rugby league, Great Britain have to travel down under themselves to win the world championship. And they'll go there with two good wins under their belt against France, 52-4, and here, Papua New Guinea, 42-0. At club level, Halifax won a thrilling Challenge Cup final thanks to this drop goal. Attempted drop from Pendleberry. Yes, it's done. So Halifax's first victory since 1939, a remarkable turnaround in the fortunes of the club. All other trophies ended up at Wigan. Ellery Hanley chipped in 62 tries. Case looking to offload to Hanley. Hanley is going for the post. Is he in? Yes! Hanley's there. That's why he's valued at £150,000. They followed trophy and Lancashire Cup wins with the Championship and the Premiership. At one stage, they went 29 games without defeat. He's still got the ball. Is he over? Yes! Well, Joe Ryder is dead. He does the trick. With teams like Wigan around, no wonder rugby league crowds are up again in 1987. Although Leeds put a bit of a dent in the Wigan uh, domination yesterday. Now, David Kirk, the triumphant All Blacks captain, is with me here. Now at Oxford University, how are you enjoying varsity life? Oh, good. It's a bit of a challenge for me. I'm enjoying it. I don't know whether you enjoyed the, uh, the varsity match on Tuesday afternoon because you went down to Cambridge University. Well, you got your name on the score sheet, though. We can see that try now. Uh, typical bit of opportunism. Yeah, the ball was there. I just picked it up and ran with it. <laughs> <laughs> Simple principle. <laughs> how did you enjoy the occasion? Oh, very much so. It was a marvellous occasion. There's a tremendous number of, of people there. I was a bit surprised by Comparable atmosphere to that great triumph at the World Cup? Well, I don't think I was as nervous, for sure. Uh, no, there wasn't as much hanging on the game for me personally, or of course, the country. But uh, that was a great atmosphere there. Now, give us a bit of encouragement. Have you seen anything in recent weeks that suggests the home countries might eventually close the gap on uh, you New Zealanders? No. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say that because I think in the last year or so, I think New Zealand have got appreciably better. And in fact, they're accelerating. So if, if you don't start to accelerate here, the gap will widen. Well, thanks for giving us that optimism. <laughs> <laughs> David Kirk, ladies and gentlemen. Of course, the racing world this year was shocked by the fall from grace of the outstanding jockey of our time, Lester Piggott. However, the sport itself continued to produce great champions and wonderful stories. There was the epic duel between Steve Cawthon and Pat Edry for the jockey's title. Peter Scudamore dominated the national hunt scene once again, while Jim Joel realised a lifelong ambition 
and I mean long, the 93-year-old owner won the Grand National at last. His horse, Maori Venture, was ridden by Steve Knight and trained by Andy Turnell. G. Armitage was top lady jockey over fences and Nicky Henderson, leading trainer. They were starting to call Henderson's champion hurdler, See You When. Until 10 days before Cheltenham, he hadn't been seen for 11 months. But on the day, he and jockey Steve Smith Eccles delivered the goods. Let's see you then, making turf history as he strides away now from Slatter and Gladbrook again. But Slatter putting in a tremendous finish. Slatter also putting to the line. Slatter getting up with every stride. But see you then, as funny. See you then, as funny. After the first champion hurdle hat trick for 17 years, now he aims for the first ever four timer. In a year of floods and hurricanes, Go Cup Day was greeted by snow. The race was delayed by an hour and 20 minutes as the fences and the surrounding Cotswolds were covered with a white blanket. When the race finally started at 10 to 5, it was a thrill. And it's Cy Brandian with the advantage from the thicker Wayward Lad, forgiven, forget and go, but thrown them into the closing stages. Cy Brandian being chased all the time by Wayward Lad over on the far side, the thicker go. man who was missing, trainer Arthur Stevenson, racing at Hexham. The road to Aintree had a different meaning for Alden Eaty. He walked all 250 miles, with 250 different riders, including two members of the royal family, to raise £810,000 for cancer research, and completing his journey with Bob Champion up at Liverpool on the big day. West Tip was favoured to win for a second time. The winner was almost unconsidered. Brilliant triumph for jockey Steve Knight, trainer Andy Turnell, and owner Mr. Jim Joel, who missed the race by 12 hours traveling from South Africa. Peter Scudamore was an easy winner of his third jockey's title. And the galloping girls had a big season, with pretty G. Armitage becoming the first to beat the pros at Cheltenham. The Princess Royal rode a winner over fences this autumn, but her greatest triumph came on the flat at Ascot in July winning the Dresden Diamond on the four-year-old ten-no trumps, to evident royal approval. The horse of the year was the Derby winner, Reference Point, who sealed his status in the race of the year, the King George VI and Queen Elizabeth Diamond Stakes. helped champion trainer Henry Cecil to two new records, an incredible 180 winners worth over £1.8 million. It was also a sad year for Cecil. His father-in-law, the great Sir Noel Merlis, died at the age of 77. While his former jockey, Lester Piggott, was jailed for three years for tax evasion. The last two months were enlivened by the closest struggle for 24 years for the jockey's title, between the champion Pat Eddery and the former champion American Steve Cawthon. They dominated race after race. In the end, Cawthon won it on the very last day. Nothing had ever given him more satisfaction. And now another reminder for you. Here's John Joe O'Neill on this program this time last year. And John Joe is with us once again. to see you looking so well. Uh, what are the doctors saying about the old cancer? Well, they're quite happy with all the, the latest um, reports, so we're quite happy. I feel good, so just bang on, keep going. You're looking good. Um, you be back training and everything? Yeah, back trying to train a few winners, yeah. They're hard to come by. <laughs> no luck yet? <laughs> yeah, we had a few, yeah. We're taking away nicely. We've got a nice yard together now, so yeah. very nice young horses mm -hmm. to look forward to. 
you rode the winner of most of the great races, with the exception of the national, of course. If you could train the winner of a, of a great race, which one would you choose? Which one would you pick? I'd like to win the Gold Cup, really. The Gold Cup again? Yes, that would be nice. Right. Now, you're involved in a, in a, uh, a cancer charity, aren't you? Yes, we've got the John Joe Cancer Research Fund for the Christie's Hospital in Manchester, and it's going very well. Um, it's just a matter of saying thank you to the hospital. Mm. And it's very difficult to uh, single out anybody individually, so uh, we thought it was a good idea to uh, raise some money for the, for the Cancer Research Fund, which helps everybody. Splendid. We might have a little surprise for you later. John Joe O'Neill, ladies and gentlemen. There hasn't always been such a happy solution to the sporting stories of 1987, and it was events on the cricket field which demonstrated above all just how fragile is the thread which binds international sport. For the players of England and Pakistan, familiarity has bred contempt, contempt for opponent and for umpire. First, at Headingley, where television replays revealed Botham was clearly not caught behind. And then in Lahore, where Chris Broad had to be forcibly persuaded to leave the field, having been given out. And finally, this week in Faisalabad, where Mike Gatting's eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball conversation with Mr Rana threatened to end a tour and divide the cricket-playing nations. For the England captain, it was a sad end to a year which had started so well. It was a happy Mike Gatting who returned from Australia with the Ashes and a batch of one-day trophies. Pakistan, however, with Imran leading for the last time, were to prove tougher opposition. Rainy weather was the only winner in the first two tests, Old Trafford and Lords both washed out. Then at Headingley, Imran was in fine form, England beaten by an innings. That's gone, 31 to 5. They almost got a test match back at Edgbaston in an exciting run chase. Run out chance, left-hander, and he's run him out. The fifth test was also drawn, and Pakistan won the series 1-0. The bicentenary test, that new mound stand adorning the occasion, was a happy affair. Best players in the world were there, they took it very seriously and enjoyed it all as well. The cricket was spectacular, ferocious bowling by Malcolm Marshall, and tremendous hitting from the likes of Gooch, Gatting, Gavaskar and Greenwich. And some inspired fielding as well. Well, a brilliant piece of fielding there. You won't see a better piece of fielding than that. Magnificent. Roger Harper's teammate, Viv Richards, missed the Lord's celebrations because of new commitments with Lancashire League Rishton. Meanwhile, his old colleague Ian Botham was helping his new team, Worcestershire, to the Sunday League title. Yorkshire won the Benston Hedges Cup. Phil Carrick, the new leader while Richard Hadley took knots to a last over win in the NatWest final. What a hit from Richard Hadley. Hadley the hero in his last match. Alas, Northant skipper Jeff Cook led the unlucky losers in both domestic finals. David Hughes was named captain of the year, a strong run by Lancashire in the county championship. But Hadley and Rice made sure they retired in style. Knots won that title by just four points. The fourth World Cup was played in India and Pakistan this autumn. The host sides were the favourites. England included Graham Gooch, back after a summer of exile, and Alan Lamb. And it was Lamb who proved the hero of the first match against West Indies. With overs running out, his hitting was crucial. So was the wayward bowling of Courtney Walsh, who had to bowl the final over. Down the left side, four wide, four wide. It was left to Neil Foster to supply the winning runs. It's in the gap. It's there. Well played, Foster. And all too much for Walsh. Because England lost twice to Pakistan, they had to beat the West Indies at Jaipur. Beautifully played. Quite regal. Gooch's brilliant 92 set them on the way. And then Eddie Hemmings proved an unlikely hero when Viv Richards threatened to cut loose. Hemming's strike proved crucial. England were now in the semis, but no one gave them a chance against India at Bombay. Once again, it was Gooch dominating the innings, sweeping his way to a superb 115 of a total of 254. 
De Freitas got Gavaskar early. But Kapildev threatened to win it. Hemmings came back, hopefully. That's a big hit. Gatting's under it. <coughs> and he scores it. England won by 35. And so to the final against Australia. Calcutta, Eden Gardens, 80,000 spectators, and Boone gets the Aussies off to a flying start. Beautifully placed. Then Valletta and Border plundered vital runs in the last 10 overs. Oh, lovely shot. Australia's total of 2-5-3 looked good. After the first over of England's innings, it looked even better. Might well be out. First ball. So, Australia are on their way. England were always struggling after that, and when Alan Border won the Battle of the Skippers, the Aussies were home by seven runs. Joy for Australia, their first World Cup. Well, in motorsport, Britain once again produced winners in 1987, not least of which Derek Bell, who won the Le Mans 24-hour race for the fifth time. Derek also had a crack at the RAC rally for the first time, where well, he didn't last quite as long as 24 hours. What happened? About 24 minutes. It seemed to be rather like a horse it didn't take to water too well. <laughs> You're going to have another crack next year? Well, I think so, but I'll try, I think I'll try a different model car next time. <laughs> you better not say which. And, uh, and Le Mans again? It looks like it, yes, another 24 hours of purgatory, I yeah. suppose. You seem to like it, though. <laughs> For Nigel Mansell, the sports personality of 1986, it was another year of so near and yet so far. He won more Grand Prix races than anyone else, but the right man needs not only the right car, but the right kind of luck. Mansell's 1986 rivals provided the competition again in 87. Teammate Nelson Piquet, Ayrton Senna of Lotus, defending champion Alain Prost at McLaren, who won the opening round in Brazil. Nelson Piquet, second in Brazil, suffered a huge accident in practice for the second round of the San Marino Grand Prix. The Williams Honda as fast as ever, and thankfully as strong as ever. But the injured Piquet was ruled out of a race which saw Mansell surge past Senna to claim his first victory of the season. An early championship lead for Mansell, but he was back in fourth place by the time of the British Grand Prix in July. The great British hope brought his golf coach to Silverstone, but there was nothing wrong with his driving. Forced to make a tyre stop at half distance, Mansell then set about reeling in the leader PK. The decisive moment coming as they sped towards Stowe Corner at 190 miles an hour. Oh! And Mansell is through. Mansell has won the British Grand Prix for the second year in succession. Mansell's third win in seven races, Piquet's fifth second place, and Mansell claimed the Silverstone crowd had been worth five seconds a lap, and the lap of honour itself became more like a papal visit. Piquet claimed his first win of the season in Germany, and then gave his signature to Lotus boss Peter War for 1988. In Hungary, a tiny mishap for Mansell. But that flying wheel nut is enough to cost him the lead and gift another victory to PK, who's able to stretch his lead in the championship to seven points. Nelson picks up the pieces. He will be a very happy man to have received such a generous gift. Mansell now 18 points adrift and out of luck. He fought back to win in Austria, but then when leading the Portuguese Grand Prix, retired once more with a dead engine but at least his retirement enabled Alain Prost to finally pass Jackie Stewart's total of 27 Grand Prix wins. This is a record. Alain Prost wins his 28th Grand Prix. Back came Mansell to win in Spain and then Mexico, and with Piquet second there, the magnificent Williams team had long since claimed the constructors' title. Piquet on course for the Drivers' Championship, but Mansell could still beat him if he won in Australia and Japan. But practice at Suzuka put paid to that. A back injury ends his season and meant that Nelson Piquet was world champion for the third time. Mansell's year, six wins, eight pole positions, but still no title. Jonathan Palmer of Tyrrell claimed a trophy, though, the Jim Clark Cup in the non-turbo class. Derek Bell lost his world sports car crown this year, but still won his fifth victory at Le Mans. Britain's Gordon Spice won the C2 class at Le Mans and also retained his world title. 
Meanwhile, the British Jaguars won just about everywhere but Le Mans, and they claimed the World Sports Car Championship by Nürburgring in August. On two wheels, Wayne Gardner on a Honda became the first Australian to win the 500cc World Motorcycling Championship. Gardner clinching the title in the penultimate round in Brazil. And on three wheels, it was British success. Steve Webster and Tony Hewitt winning the British Grand Prix at Donington, and shortly afterwards, they were crowned world sidecar champions. And Steve Webster and Tony Hewitt, plus their world championship winning machine, with us here. Tony is the long-suffering passenger. Steve is the driver. You call it a driver? Yeah, that's right, yeah. He's got handlebars here. And <coughs> right. Gears Chief mechanic different. as well. You do all the nuts and bolts and everything. Yeah, we do a lot of work ourselves. And it's quite a, big, quite a big team, though, so it's been a team effort this year. Now, the driver's job seems quite straightforward. You just wind it up as hard as you can go. But have you ever been tempted to do this job? Passenger? I've only ever been on there once, and it was about seven years ago. And I've never actually been on a sidecar before. And my father sat me in there, and he really frightened me, so that's... You can stay there. <laughs> so this really is the frightening end. This sure. is quite a luxurious end, isn't it, really, Tony? Because you've got a range of, what, three positions you can take up? Yeah, yeah, it's really comfy here, yeah. Um, <laughs> Give us your repertoire. Right, well, right-handers are over the back here. Left-handers... <laughs> as far as the legs will push. And all this at, what, about 140 miles an hour, something like that? Yeah, well, it's no problem, really, because I've, I've had the sidecar's uh, operation, you know. You still see the scars, the uh, <laughs> passengers. And your backside is the fourth wheel sometimes. That's right, as well. yeah, yeah. But the other key is the loyalty between the two of you. You never get off, no matter how grim things are looking. And we remember two years ago in Assen, where you must have been fairly tempted to get off. This was the yeah. first time you were leading a Grand Prix, yeah, wasn't it? I was very tempted to jump off. Uh, we slid, then we got into our <laughs> bike. I thought, shall I get off? Too late. <laughs> Stayed with me right till the end. Yeah. Stayed with you right till the end. We all laugh at that, but uh, you had some quite nasty injuries. Not as bad as they could have been, Steve. Yeah, I think looking at it now, I was lucky just to get away with a broken arm and uh, Tony damaged his back, but uh, it could have been a lot worse. That great victory at Donington in the British Grand Prix, we all enjoyed. It set you up for the world title. How emotional was that occasion? I think it's always um, it's been a big thing for me to actually win the, the home Grand Prix and doing it in the same year as winning the World Championship. I think. I actually got more of a thrill out of winning the home Grand Prix. It was uh, it's quite an experience that I'll never forget. We all enjoy seeing it. Hang on to the bike next year, and most importantly, hang on to the title as well. Our world sidecar champions. Well, there are a good few others here tonight who can lay claim to a world championship in one way or another. David Kirk, who we've met, captain of the World Cup winning All Blacks. Fatima, of course. And Steve Davis, he's just retained his UK snooker title, as you know, and earlier in the year regained to the World Championship, which had actually eluded him for a couple of years. Joe wondering if this championship is now slipping away from him. Steve Davis becomes World Snooker Champion for the first time. Nice to get it back, eh, Steve? Yeah, I, I was very pleased at the time. I think more relieved because um, to play Joe in the, in the final again mm. after he'd murdered me the year before, 18, something like that, <laughs> was, uh, I was so pleased for him as well because um, he'd had a bad season up until then. He showed people that he wasn't just a sort of one-hit wonder. Yes. Does it get any easier or does it no, get harder? No, not at all. Well, there's a lot more younger players coming in. Stephen Hendry won his first points ranking tournament this season mm. and he just, along with Mike Hallett's, uh, won the doubles. So Stephen's having a great... Tournament student. I think he's spearheading the youngsters. He's, he's the outstanding young, yeah, young yeah. player. Well, you're a young man yourself, but with snooker... You. <laughs> <laughs> with, uh, with snooker, you could go on indefinitely, couldn't you? I mean, do you ever think how long you might go on? Well, Fred Davis is now about uh, 72, I think. I'm not too sure exactly if that's about right. And he's still enjoying himself. And uh, I think I'm... I'm uh, I was pleased that uh, Jack Nicholas last year won the, the Open because uh, I think, you know, if you're enjoying yourself doing something and not like some of the athletic sports where you can go on for longer, we're, we're, we're lucky in that way. If you're enjoying it, you can do it. Right. Another 40 years for you then. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are many other British world champions to salute tonight, uh, beginning with a lady right here, Anne-Marie Farron, who probably gives Steve here, uh, Steve here a pretty good game. <laughs>
What an achievement for Norman Duncan. A truly remarkable game of billiards. Redgrave are going to win by three quarters of a length. That's good for Great Britain. Real concentration from this shaman there. Total harmony with the water. There's Richard Fox leading. Russ Smith neatly through there. Melvin Jones safely out. And this looks better from the British. Double ten. Yeah! Shot! The 1987 World Professional Champion, John Lowe! This close. He's got the shot bowl, sat in its place, to pose a championship winning line. Well, there you have a selection of British sports stars who can proudly claim to be the best in the world. Let's salute those that are present and those that are absent, the world champions of 1987. in tennis it was the year when the Aussie Pat Cash would plead absolutely guilty to treading on people to get to the top. He used their shoulders, their arms, even one gentleman's head to climb towards his friends and loved ones having won the Wimbledon title. His spontaneous reaction broke the rules but touched our hearts. The Crocodile Dundee of the tennis court. Britain took the mixed doubles title at Wimbledon, the first all-British win there since the days of Fred Perry. But there was little else to celebrate on the home front in the Davis Cup and Whiteman Cup, usual story. 
Perhaps Warren Jakes, one of the world's most respected coaches, can give our players a little more of that Pat Cash-style Aussie grit. One thing Britain did dominate, the court covering championships. With the entire opening day washed out, Wimbledon had to speed things up, and a hasty exit was made in the first week by Boris Becker at the hands of Australian Peter Doohan, a 500 to one outsider. Shots like that left champion Becker floundering and facing defeat. He's done it. It's out. Becker dismissed his downfall without passion. Well, basically, I lost a tennis match, you know. I didn't lose a war, uh, nobody died, I lost a tennis match. As the year went on, he'd lose more. This man gave Wimbledon its finest match, Jimmy Connors playing Mikhail Pemforce of Sweden at this end. Connors needed the breaks. He'd been two sets down and one four down. The Swede could only bow to the inevitable. At 34, Connors still likes the taste of blood. That's it. You get the impression he rather enjoyed that win. Pat Cash arriving for the final with family. He must play Ivan Lendl, who's in the final for the second year running. Cash has already beaten Villander and Connors. Lendl has put out Leconte and Edberg. Cash is playing the most inspired tennis of his life. Yes! And now the Australian is at match point in straight sets. It was at this triumphant moment that Cash decided he wanted to be a social climber. Pat Cash, the first Australian man to win Wimbledon since John Newcomb. And for Britain, splendid success in the mixed doubles from the unseeded Joe Dury and Jeremy Bates. They were the first British winners of this event for 51 years, since the days of Fred Perry and Dorothy Round. Rain in New York delays the US Open final 24 hours. Mats Volander of Sweden plays the inevitable Ivan Lendl, who loses the first set, but wins the next three. Yes, he's done it, he's done it. It was a replay of the French final, and it confirmed Lendl's status as the world's undisputed number one. But there was plenty of dispute among the ladies. In the French final, Martina Navratilova's long domination was being challenged by 18-year-old Steffi Graf from West Germany. <laughs> Martina fought hard. She actually went ahead 5-4 in the final set. That was more like the old Martina, but where match point was against her, disaster. It's a double four. It was the teenager's first win in a Grand Slam event. Was Martina's crown slipping at last? A month later, they met again in the Wimbledon final, and once more Martina was having problems with the young lady. Martina, at 30, summed up years of experience and all her skills. Game first set was never to over. So now she serves for the match, the championship, and revenge. Game That's it. She's done it. A marvelous victory for her. Martina had made her point where it mattered at Wimbledon. Her eighth title at this supreme championship for her place in Wimbledon history alongside the legendary Helen Wills Moody. Martina was still the star. And so to the US Open final, once again Martina versus the young pretender. And Steffi Graf is playing well enough to force a tie break in the opening set. Fabulous. Fabulous play. But Martina wins that tiebreak, and now she's hammering Steffi in the second set. Yeah. 
Steffi one five down and staring at defeat in another major final. It's out. That's it. Never to Lola. The computer says Steffi Graf is the world's number one. But the form in this year's top events clearly indicates that Martina Navratilova is still champion of the world. For those two Grand Slam wins, and for her domination of women's tennis for so long, our Overseas Personality Award goes to Martina Navratilova. In America, to present it on our behalf, her great friend and rival, Chris Evert. They asked me to present you this award since I've won it. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> a couple of years ago. And I think it's great that at um, 31 years old, you're still winning these types of awards. I think it's great. When, are you going to retire soon or let us well, have a chance? First, you have to retire. You're older than I am. Don't you remember? I am. At least a year. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I think, it's, I think it's really great. And since you haven't won too many awards this year, only the two biggest tournaments in the world, Wimbledon and the U.S. Open, um, I'd like to present this BBC Television Overseas Sports Personality Award to you. I think it's very merited. From one person on to another. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you very much. I guess uh, I didn't even know, frankly, that this award existed until Chris won it a couple of years ago. <laughs> and uh, that sort of brought it to my attention. And it, it's always very special when you win something when you don't expect it, particularly this year, since, as Chris pointed out, I haven't uh, really won that much. But as uh, I think all you people in England know how much Wimbledon means to me, and uh, winning it there probably uh, was the highlight of my career, uh, certainly the highlight of this year. And I'd like to thank you all for, uh, for being there, watching, and hopefully uh, we'll get to see you next year because I'm certainly planning on being at Wimbledon, as I'm sure Chris is also. And uh, I'd like to thank the viewers, and uh, thank you. And still two more awards to come tonight, Team of the Year and the result of your voting for Personality of the Year, all based on over 2,000 hours of televised sport, during which we've seen some outstanding performances and some very encouraging ones with Calgary and Seoul in mind. It's been a memorable pre-Olympic year for Adrian Morehouse. In February, he broke the short course world record for the 100 meters breaststroke, the minute barrier falling at last. In August, he was going for gold at the distance in the European Championships. Morehouse is going to touch first. He touches, and it's a new European record. The 100 meters butterfly came Britain's way too, around the neck of Andrew Jameson. Back in the spring, a yank at Oxford found a new meaning. Five of them didn't want to row with their president. Perhaps they knew what the weather would be like come boat race day. The starter was double Oxford Blue Colin Monion. By June, he'd be Minister for Sport. And the crews went off in different directions. But with his experience of choppy water, Donald MacDonald, the beleaguered Oxford president, had the last laugh. So too did Dennis Connor. He put back the stars and stripes on the America's Cup. The multitude crossed Tower Bridge again in the London Marathon. And there was another Japanese winner, Taniguchi, with Ingrid Christensen, the first lady home. The peaks of the Himalayas attracted British girls Alison Wright and Helen Diamantides, who became new idols for the locals after running 64 miles in four days from Everest to Kathmandu. Over more familiar routes, Malcolm Elliott pedalled his way to victory in the milk race. But the cyclist of the year was Stephen Roach, the hero of Dublin after winning the Tour de France. At skiing's World Championships at Cron Montana, eight of the ten gold medals went to Switzerland. Permin Zubrigan, the World Cup winner, was favourite for the downhill. But Peter Muller, his fellow countryman, pipped him for the title. The pattern was repeated in the ladies' event. Maria Valliser was the winner and had the smile to prove it, leaving the silver medal and a consolation kiss to the World Cup victor, Michaela Figini. When it came to speed, Britain's Graham Wilkie set the standard. 
132.06 miles an hour. Durham Wasps took ice hockey's major prize. It's in front, and there's another one! Another one! A victory over Murrayfield Racers in the playoffs final greeted with enormous enthusiasm. In hockey's top tournament at home, Sean Curley proved he's still the sharpest around. And the continued rise of the Great Britain team saw them seeded second for the Seoul Olympics. And our girls will be there as well. Squash saw the demise of one great champion from Pakistan, Jahinga Khan, and the confirmation of another, Yansha Khan, the younger by six years. Gymnastics came bouncing back with some electrifying displays in the World Championships in Rotterdam. Aurelia Dobre of Top Team Romania was the ladies' overall champion. But the return to the top of the Soviet star, Dmitry Bidotsetsev, following a car crash, provided the greatest talking point. The Great Britain show jumping team retained the European title, with John Whittaker winning the individual silver medal. The three-day event team went one better. Ian Stark on Sawati took the silver, the team won the gold, and the drinks were on the rider of nightcap. And here we go, into the last for the gold. And the new champion for Great Britain, Virginia Lynn. Incidentally, our colleague Alan Weeks, whose voice you will have heard there, has been under the weather for the last few days or so. I know he's watching tonight, so we'd like to wish you well, Alan. Well, now to the great boom sport of the moment, golf. What a year! So many British success stories, but it was an Irishman who came closest to giving us all heart failure. Old Eamon here. You won't get a smile out of him very much, but by golly, he did when that putt went in at Moorfield Village. I'm sure he still dreams about it, probably occasionally misses it but he didn't when it counted. The beautiful thing about golf right now is that while they used to do it over here, at last we've proven we can do it over there. The Tournament Players' Championship in Florida was where Europe struck its first major blow when Sandy Lyle collected one of America's most coveted prizes. But two weeks later, at Augusta in the US Masters, a quiet American, Larry Mize, played the shot of the year to win in a playoff against Greg Norman and Seve Ballesteros. <laughs> and they say the meek shall inherit the earth. What about that? On to Muirfield in Scotland for the Open. Greg Norman, the defending champion, was soon to become an ex-champion, like his three pals here. Another Australian, Roger Davis, led the way on the opening day with a fine 64, seven under par. The following day, Paul Azinger, America's leading money winner, shot from the pack to take the lead with this master stroke at the 18th. But Muirfield's bunkers took their toll elsewhere. We all sympathized with Arnold Palmer. It took him five goes to get this one out. The third day conjured up some of the ugliest weather the Open's ever seen. Even the great players had their scores torn apart. And yet, one man did conquer it, Sandy Lyle, round in a wonderful par 71. And England's Nick Faldo also playing par golf. I think he likes it. Steadiness like that and a slight improvement in the weather kept him within one shot of the leader, Azinger. For the final day, the weather relented and the chase was on. Roger Davis put together a 69. Now he had to wait to see if anyone could beat his 280. Meanwhile, Faldo was keeping his golf together very tidily. Behind him, Azinger, the American, was now three shots clear of the field. But on the 10th, he made one of those errors that were to prove very costly. On this, his first trip to Britain. The 18th. If Faldo can get a four here, he will have parred every single hole on this final round.
His score, 279. Only Azinger could match it or beat it. But the American was bunkered at the 18th. Azinger's face told the story. Now he had to sink a long putt to force Faldo into a playoff. Faldo is the champion, and congratulations to him. A week later in America, Britain struck again. Laura Davis, a mighty thrasher of the ball, became the first Britain to win the US Women's Open. The girl from Surrey triumphed in a three-way playoff. Amazingly, like Faldo, it was her first win of the year. And then Muirfield Village, Ohio, and Europe's defense of the Ryder Cup. These, ladies and gentlemen, are the 12 men who are gonna try to win this great trophy for the first time on American soil. We're really looking forward to the challenge. The Spanish pairing of Elazabal and Ballesteros helped us hold the Americans to two all after a shaky start on the opening morning. Ian Woosnam, partnering Faldo, was in blinding form in the afternoon four balls. Europe won all four matches to lead 6-2 at the end of the first day. Next morning, in the foursomes, Elazabal sank this tricky putt that his partner had left him. Europe had edged even further ahead. Later, drama at the 18th, the final match of the day, and Europe needed to win it to share the afternoon points. At this moment, Bernhard Langer played this shot. Europe could smell victory. Woosnam was first away in the final day singles. We needed three and a half points to retain the cup, four for our first win on American soil. However, first blood went to America's Andy Bean. Howard Clark won us a point, Sam Torrance a half, but then we lost four matches. Was victory slipping away? Ben Crenshaw had broken his putter in a fit of temper, but was still locked in battle with Eamon Darcy. Europe badly needed a point, and Darcy is faced with a difficult downhill putt. That's a crucial point. It certainly was. Darcy's heroic putt meant that a half and a win was now all we needed. The half came when America's Larry Nelson somewhat strangely agreed to share his match with Bernhard Langer. And then at the 17th, it was all down to Ballesteros. Let history show that that was it to put them at 14 and a half. Ryder Cup history had been made. For the first time in 60 years, the Americans had been vanquished on their own territory. The celebrations began. Europe's skipper, Tony Jacklin, could scarcely find the words to match his emotion. This compares more... This is the greatest week of my life. That's all I can say. What's up there? Amid all the jubilation, you had to spare a thought for Jack Nicholas, his team beaten on his course in his own hometown. Jacqueline's men came home to be welcomed like the conquering heroes they were. Just one week later, on the old course at St Andrews, England's team were triumphant in the Dunhill Cup, with the Americans and Australians nowhere. And so to Wentworth, where Ian Woosnam was again playing some of the finest golf of his life in the hurricane-torn World Match Play Championship. What an amazing year this 29-year-old Welshman was having. Right into the heart of the grid. Look at that for a shot. Really is majestic striking. It was the first time two Britons had been involved in the match play final. Woosnam was battling against Sandy Lyle. Go! Oh. Whoa! Whoa! Whoa. And that was a sensational stroke. He was about to become the first British winner of the match play. Yeah. Yeah. Done his Oh, what a great moment for Ian Wisdom. And later he won the World Cup team and individual prizes and then collected the world's first million dollar prize at Sun City to take his total for the season to more than a million pounds.
the target for the year, and it's here. So are eight members of the triumphant Ryder Cup team. And Ian Woosnam, million pound man. What a end to the season for you. And uh, a fair rise in the housekeeping for Glendrith, I should think. That's right. Uh... Uh, there's a few things you can buy for Christmas that you couldn't get before. <laughs> <laughs> You're making ends meet, like. I just, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't look now. I just let us go out and spend it. <laughs> <laughs> Money is a fair inspiration, but what really was behind this tremendous form of yours in 87? Uh, I think uh, to try and get to become the best player in the world, I think. You know, I think everybody strives to become the best player in the world. I think they a dream of becoming the best player in the world, and that's what you go out to, and that's what keeps you going, I think. Do you feel you've now proved that? Well, I'm on my way, you know, I'm, I've ranked sixth in the world now and I think the way I've played this year, I must play for this year, I could say I'm the best player this year, but uh, there's still a long way to go yet. And still waiting for that first major and you give a fair bit for, for Nick's Open title, I should think. That's right, I was asked the question, would I swap my year for Nick's and uh, I don't know, I've won a lot of money, but uh, I'd still like to win the, the Open Championship too. Nick, do you want to do the deal here? <laughs> I'll move my wallet to this side, just, <laughs> just in case something oozes out. <laughs> You must have daydreamed about winning the Open over the years, but what was the reality like? I did more than daydreaming, yes. It, uh, you know, I spent half my life now working for that goal, and uh, you put it all together, and all of a sudden you feel right, and I'd worked hard on my game for the last two years, and uh, thankfully David came over and worked with me, and then you know, I felt I was swinging as well as I'd ever swung the club the week before, so that's a, a good mental feeling before you start a, an Open. Two hard years of work that proved worthwhile certainly did. I mean, there was times when it was, uh, well, it was, it was tough, you know. But, um, you know, I put things back together. Early this April was the breakthrough. We worked for a couple of weeks then and, and it all clicked. So Ian's million pounds, your open title and the Ryder Cup. And the pressure putt in the Ryder Cup, of course, went to this man. Eamon, what does the brain actually do when you're standing over a putt with all that, all that hanging on it? Well, the more I see that putt, Steve, um... It looks shorter every time I look at it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, when I was trying to make it, it was a bit longer than that. When, when the blade hit the ball, was it one of those putts that you felt was in from the moment you hit it, or you had a few moments of doubt? No, I was helping it in all the way down. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Tony Jacklin here, you never had any doubts about him and all the rest of the team here. Well, I, I, we felt very confident going in there. Uh, they, I said before the matches, I thought the balance of power in golf uh, rested in Europe, and I think these... Great men proved that. Uh, I must say that putt of Eamon seemed to take about half an hour to get to the <laughs> hole from where I was standing. It does look shorter than it did on the day, but it was a wonderful occasion and it was a privilege for me to and be involved with these boys. We all saw the effect on you in, in the interviews after the triumph, so obviously you've been through quite a great deal. You've now made the decision to captain the team in 1989 at the Belfry. How hard was that decision? Well, at the end of the day, uh, nobody else seemed to want to do it. And uh, <laughs> I, I think I look back and I've had a good time doing it. I enjoy uh, the situation and uh, I was always happy uh, to stand sideways if somebody else wanted to come along. And I wanted to be sure that wasn't the case before I accepted it. And it seems that uh, the powers that be behind closed doors decided that that would be okay to carry on. So. Uh, We'll give it another try in 89. Let's hope we can keep it at home. Splendid. The rest of the team and the rest of British Golf are delighted with that decision, I'm sure. And I'm sure they'll also be delighted to hear that the Ryder Cup team have been named Team of the Year. And to make the presentation of the award, the 1987 captain of the Professional Golfers Association, and what a year to be captain, Peter Alice. It's a double pleasure for me to present you with this because I know the delights of being on a winning side and also for you gentlemen to have done it in the year when I was captain. It, I, I mean, uh, an earldom is now certain. So thank you very much, Tony. Well done to you all. Thank you very much. Great stuff. Thank you. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. And uh, I'd like you perhaps to take your seats now, with the exception of Nick and Ian. Perhaps they'd hang on for me for just a moment or two. You know we always have a little bit of fun and games in this, uh, in this particular programme. Of the two of you, who hits the golf ball further? <laughs> Him. Well, tonight we're going to ask you to hit the golf ball as far as you possibly can, 
uh, for a very special reason, not just for the fun of it, what but is? for a very special reason which will become clear in due course. Uh, I think you'll have to take your jackets off, uh, so perhaps we can get someone to, uh, to take those. It's a little unfair, because I know you haven't got the right gear or shoes with grips or anything, but you can manage. No problem. Now, the way we're going to do it, we have a special machine here, you see, which is very accurate. It not only uh, shows the distance you hit the ball, but the direction in which you hit the ball. Uh, Rob here works the machine. Now, do you want to see the hole that you're going to be playing? Yeah. Well, there it is. It's a uh, dog leg right, 370 yards, uh, a bit of a water hazard. You have water problem, uh, Nick. Uh, trees either side. And that little block down on the right will show you exactly how far uh, you hit the ball. So, Nick, would you like to go first? Uh, <laughs> Come on, this, can't, on, this can't be a bigger gallery than the Open Championship. We've got a selection of drivers here for you. You can pick anyone you like. They're all fairly cheap. Eh? Got a Wilson? You mustn't say things like that on the BBC. <laughs> yeah. you'll, you'll, have to, you'll have to renegotiate my contract for me, yes? Thanks very much, yeah, Nick. Now. Right, let's see what you can Is do this with it? this one. Yeah, oh have gosh. a practice first. Was that it? Oh, you're a tall man. We nearly hit the roof with you. But uh, see what you can do with that. Am I allowed to get closer? <laughs> you see, all the great pros practice what first. What on earth is this, though, here? Yeah. Well, <laughs> it'll show exactly what you it's do. It's going to explode, Mind yeah? about that. Not yeah. at all. God, dear. Slice, Went huh? off a little bit. You don't normally slice. Do. Uh, do you do? <laughs> oh, well, have another go then. See what you can <laughs> do with this. <laughs> what a hook this time. Yeah. No, I want it straight this time and as far as you can because there's a special reason for it. Straight with a bit of draw and, and all that. Oh! <laughs> Where'd it go? Uh, how many yards did that go? I'm not quite sure. I'm perhaps there's something wrong with the machine. I don't know. Anyway, thanks very much, Nick. Uh, <laughs> 200. <laughs> 66 yards, is it? Is it? Yes. That was right. a hook. Yeah. And that was, and that was with Play his well. new swing. Well, thank you. <laughs> right, Nick's done 266 yards. We won't worry about the direction, Nick. Now here's Woozy. <laughs> Come on, is that, I hope that club's all right for you. I hope it doesn't yeah. slip out of me. No problem for you. Let's see how far this goes. About three miles, you watch. <laughs> Oh, it's gone ah. off the screen. Well, <laughs> yeah, fine. Um, okay. Have you plugged that in this time? Right, have another go. Oh, right. I knew this machine would let us down. Oh, oh yeah, it's a better one. Look at that. He skied that. Yeah, you, he was. He was two five eight yards. You were going. You were actually oh. going for the green there. I think two five zero, two five zero yards. Right, have one more go for us, okay. uh, Ian. <laughs> oh. Yes. Oh, well. Okay. Oh, there we are. But let's have a look at the yardage that the boys have achieved uh, so far. Right? Can we have a look at that? Right. 266 oh. Oh. and 250. Oh. Faldo, the winner of that little tournament for the moment. Thank you, gentlemen. If you stay there for a moment. Now, could I call down, please, Nigel Mansell, Steve Cram, <laughs> Frank Bruno. <laughs> Laura Davis. Is Laura with us? Laura Davis? Where's Laura? Come and stand over there, Laura. Laura is, of course, the US Open champion and uh, a long hitter. Right, no, we're going to have <laughs> Nigel. No, Bruno. <laughs> Nigel first. <laughs> <laughs> Nigel first, because that's the way we've planned it. Oh, that's, that's Nigel the way you first. It. <laughs> Nigel first, please, because oh, he's the lowest yeah. handicapper. Yeah, yeah. Let's see what he can do. Oh, no, this, this isn't the right one. No good for you, wrong, mate. OK, no. give him another one. <laughs> he's got a contract as well, I suppose. Are you, are you, yeah. are you with Wilson, too? Come oh, on, oh, shit. Got on <laughs> Dear me. Oh, no, I don't like that one. Oh, dear. Right, now, let's see what you can do. <laughs> <laughs> take this off, Thank you, Bruno. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's yours. <laughs> yeah. 
Are you good at massaging the back? Yeah, right. What's the handicap now? I'll, I'll only do this as long as my specialists are not working, looking, right? <laughs> Two, I'm afraid. Two. Two handicap. It's gone quiet, hasn't it? It has. <laughs> I'm nervous. Not as nervous as not. Whoa. I say, I say, I say. You can have it. You want another go? See if you can improve on it. There's a very good reason. 200 plus yards. Go on, have another go. See if you can improve on it. How far was it? 208, I think it was.